Welcome back to the caucus room. I'm your chairman, Don Calloway, and today we have with us one of the true OGs of American politics. Let me give you his resume. A.T. Elian, three-time HBCU graduate from South Carolina State University and twice at Virginia State University, where he is currently the chairman, professor and chairman of the political science department. Former city councilor and former vice mayor of Charlottesville, Virginia. He's an activist, an author, an entrepreneur. He's a national board member of the 100 Black Men. He's a fitness influencer. He is the founder of our Black Party, a whole political party. We're going to get into that. And most importantly, a devoted father of two. Welcome to the caucus with us today, my man, Dr. Wes Bellamy. My good man, brother. My man, my man. <laughs> Welcome, man. You know, it's always a good time to be in here with a good noop, you I know, man. You, and, and, a, and a real OG. You know, thank you. I appreciate everything in what you've done for the culture, the things that you continue that. to do for the culture and for our people, and really, really just being a positive example Thanks, for a man. lot of us, man. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you, man. You know, I have only met you a few times. I've seen you like on the circuit, but I like to pride myself, man. I have a very finely tuned radar for like real. Right? <laughs> so, so like, I respect you that. Your thing yeah, yeah, yeah. On social media, I'm like, I gotta tap in with this cat because yeah. you're doing some special stuff. Um, and you've done it on a lot of different levels. Love, right? love. We're gonna get bro. into it. Now, I know you don't drink, man. Yeah. Big spirit of the caucus. Since you were new, we had to get it right. Uh, the Diggs Boys, these fellas are out of Philly. They make a solid bourbon product, so shout okay. out to Diggs Boys. Okay. Toast it for myself. Yeah, we'll, we'll toast but, it. Brother, is this bad with luck? your water? No, no, no. Oh, it's yeah, all right. love, man. Uh, toast to your ongoing success. <laughs> My so dog, love, man. man. Appreciate you. You've done extraordinarily well. So, mm. Mm. Look, man, you uh, kind of exploded onto the scene in Charlottesville. And, 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 you know, history finds us at these weird times, and you were the guy with the bow tie yeah. on one of the wildest <laughs> days in American history. Yeah. I'm sure the wildest day in the history of Charlottesville. But before we get that, man, start before that. Yeah. Uh, ATL, you're yeah. so affiliated with Virginia. Yeah. But you're from Atlanta. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and South Carolina State. Yeah. Tell me about how you came up in the A and how you got to SC. Yeah, man. Well, uh, I was originally born in South Carolina, in Atlanta Beach, South Carolina. My uh, historically dad, black beach. Historically black beach. Yeah. So like, people often ask me, why am I so pro-black? Like, I was was born and birthed around black folk thriving and succeeding. Yeah. Moved to Atlanta um, with my mom and my dad when I was, I think, one uh, or you know, shortly around that time. Uh, my dad left, so it was just me and my mom for a really long time. We bounced all over the A from the south side to the east side to the north side. You know, even sometimes I had to go back to South Carolina. She would send me back while she was getting herself together. Mm -hmm. um, but growing up in Atlanta, was it was great. And I really had the best of both worlds. Like, I grew up in a neighborhood where, you know, it maybe wasn't the best, but it was a place in which often showed me and reminded me the beauty of our people. So I always knew if I got, so I got outside of our neighborhood that, there was not only opportunities for us, but I mean, I grew up seeing Mayor Bill Campbell, Mayor Shirley Franklin, um, Kasim Reed, and, and those, people of that nature really leading our people. Like mm. my teachers were black, my firefighters I saw were black, the police chief was black, like the police right. officers were black, the people who owned the businesses were black. Right. So I knew that these are things that we could do. And then when I would go back to South Carolina during the summers or during the breaks or whatever and be with my family there, I'm on Atlantic Beach where everybody is black. Right. Like all the entrepreneurs, all the people who are doing whatever it is they're doing, they black, they look like me. So I grew up with a sense of loving my people and also just it really was instilled in me since maybe I was like four or five years old. I remember, you know, people always telling me, you know, Wes, you special. Yeah, yeah. Wesley, you're yeah. special. So when you tell a kid these things really early on, they believe it. And then you see how those things manifest over time. So, you know, I had, I've always had uh, great mentors, may not have always had, you know, my dad here to do exactly maybe what I needed him to do. He was fighting his own demons, right. but, but God has always sent me brothers and men to help guide me along the way, whether that's pastors, whether that's football coaches, mm. people around the way, whether that be the people who hustle, whether that be Nino Brown, who I'm looking at in New Jack City handing out turkeys and I'm like, I want to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a real story, Not real Carter, shit. Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to be like that. You know, Malcolm X, my mom has these these videos and VHS tapes of me walking around our house and around the store saying, I am Malcolm X. Like, yeah. I always just loved my people, and that's, that's, that's me. Is there something about, and I don't want to get too deep into the politics of the A. Yeah. Um, but 
I feel like there's something about cats that come up in Atlanta where mm -hmm. you you will catch either the entrepreneurial or the political bug, and yeah. those are kind of two sides of the same coin, right? <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. there's something about that thing that like Maynard created, yeah, or at least Maynard was a face of. Mm -hmm. That there's something about the black politics of Atlanta that's particularly special. Is that where you think you got the politics bug from? <sighs> that's a good question. Um, maybe. To be to be honest with you though. I never really considered politics in the traditional sense until I moved to Virginia. Okay. I was more so focused on understanding and loving blackness. Mm. And I always, I mean, from my earliest days, loved my people and wanted to do whatever I could to help my people. My grandmother um, on Atlantic Beach, her house was the hangout. Yeah. And like my, my aunts, my dads, my cousins, um, my family adjacent, we we always were community oriented. So for me, it was always about helping my people. And when I moved to Virginia um, after graduating from South Carolina State and spending a lot of time in our public housing sites, it was there where I really understood, like, in order to be able to shift the narrative and for these people to have the kind of experience that I had growing up around seeing blackness that was bold, I can't just do the same things. Right. Like I had a boxing club that I started. I started community days in the neighborhoods and whatnot, but I had to be in the decision-making process. And one of my boxers actually asked me, um, a nine-year-old Decoy, we were getting a, an award from city council. And he said, Coach West, why aren't, why aren't any of the people who are putting the X's in the boxes, why don't any of them look like us? Mm. And there was a situation where it was kind of like, can't talk about it. We gotta actually be about it. And that's when I decided to run for council and you know, that's the rest is history. Good. Let's back up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Orangeburg. Orangeburg. <laughs> Oberg. Oberg. Bulldogs. SC State. Yeah, man. yeah, yeah. Uh, we shared a president, Dr. Andrew Hugeni. My, <laughs> my good the brother. Goat. The GOAT. No, the they goat. don't share the president. Let me let me get this straight, man. <laughs> you know, President Hugeni, who he knows I love the, the best president ever. Shout out my, you know, I love my current president, President Abdullah, and, yeah. and President Kanye is at, at State now. There was nobody like Eugenie, and we did him yeah. dirty, and then y'all stole him. Well, yo, listen, let's, let's be clear what he's talking about. By y'all, he's, <laughs> he's talking about the illustrious Alabama a and Yeah, University. man, I, I really got some issues with y'all, but listen, that's, you know, yeah. Listen, it's, it's all love, man. Like, yeah. like, you know, when you think about an SC State mm -hmm. or, or Alabama a and mm -hmm. I would say, man, I've started to think that this is almost like the... Michigan State and Ohio State mm. of black schools. This mm. is the relevance that our institute, a large public 1890 who's been around mm. that long has all those, you know, that's the magnitude of our schools to I our like people. That. So it makes sense that a leader of that magnitude would have had a tenure yeah, at both at of those both. schools. Yeah, uh, Eugenie was a great man. Oh, uh, man. Tell me about your time at SC State. Man, I absolutely loved being at South Carolina State University. It, it honestly shaped me into the person I am. As many of us know, when you go to these HBCUs, you go in a boy, you come out a man. And for me, I came out a, a man who had an understanding of his purpose after leaving there. A much more confident person because it was there where I realized that while I've always been smart and I've always had certain skills, it was at South Carolina State where I learned that I'm truly a leader. Mm -hmm. And because I'm a leader, I need to conduct myself a certain way. So, but you know. Is it, the black college gives you an opportunity to lead. Yeah. Right? That you probably might not have at UGA yeah. or yeah. USC. Right, 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 right. Absolutely. I mean, in, in my own way, I wasn't yeah. an SGA. Yeah. I wasn't like um, a part of, uh, you know, any of the larger larger um, institutions within our school at the time, like kind of leading from a from a political perspective yeah. or a student People body don't know perspective. That there is a path. Yeah, to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On the big black yeah. college campus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There is a path to 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 grabbing power or yeah, being somebody, yeah. whatever you want to call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I was just lit. Yeah, I was just lit. I mean, <laughs> like I threw parties. You know what I'm saying? It, it's crazy. Like I was almost gonna stay at school extra semester mm -hmm. because I wanted to keep throwing parties. I was having so much fun at school, but but my daughter was about to be born, and again, like there's where I learned about fatherhood, and I was like, nah, bro, you got to get on your shit. Like yeah. you about to have a baby girl. My my baby girl Michaela, she's 14 now. You got to go to work, right. and and you know my my uh, professor. 
brother who I love and you know absolutely adore, Dr. Ora Spann, mm -hmm. consistently not only held me accountable, but spoke life into me, as did, you know, so many people at school. And and honestly now, we have homecoming um, this upcoming weekend, uh, November 4th on my birthday. Hey. And like, um, I'm so much looking forward to going back to it because whenever I go back to homecoming, it recharges my batteries. Yeah. The, the love that's shown and, and people consistently saying, you know, we're proud of you. And it's different. Like, yeah. I get told that, you know, often I have a little bit of privilege, but it's different <laughs> from people who saw you. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. When, you were, when you were young and, and people were like, damn, I remember you was fighting the plaza. You was doing yeah. A, B, and C. Yeah. And, like, we're so proud of you and keep going. Like, man, and the hugs and the love, mm -hmm. it just means, it means so much to me. So yeah. I love, I'm forever indebted to SC State. That's what's up, man. So you get a job. Yeah. And out of state and you somehow wind up in Charlottesville Bro. like and you're from the A yeah you yeah, go yeah, to state yeah. <laughs> not Atlanta not Atlanta not Charlotte not Charlotte not Nashville not Nashville you, you end up in Charlottesville how does this happen you won't God yeah God you won't believe it mm -hmm. so I um people the, the, the story is is incredible when we talk about again our institutions breeding us to be leaders I, it's a story there in itself I got a, my, my junior year, I was at a job fair and a gentleman comes to the job fair and he says, he, he's reviewing my profile, my resume, and he's like, you know, I really like you. I gotta go on a deployment, but when I get back, I'm gonna make sure you get a job in Virginia. And I'm like, yeah, all right, man, sure you will, bro. Like, <laughs> I'm going on, oh, yeah, bro, you full of shit. I get a call uh, right before spring break of my senior year. Mm -hmm. Now, I had a job offer in Greenville, another one back in Atlanta, a job offer in Charlotte. So I'm thinking, all right, this is, these are places where I'm going. I've just got to pick. Right. I get an a email, and they say, hey, we've been reviewing your profile. We want to bring you in for an interview. We want to uh, potentially offer you a job with this government agency called NGIC in Charlottesville, Virginia. Now I'm thinking, man, I ain't moving up north <laughs> to Virginia. The hell, right, I'm not right. moving up north to no damn Virginia. What, what is that? I had never been to Virginia. Right. My professor, though, she had just so happened to be there with me when I got the email. Yeah. So she's like, you smiling, and, but then your face looks crazy. What is that saying? And I'm like, well, these people, Dr. Spann, they just sent me this email saying interview, but I'm about to go to spring break. Like, we're going to Miami next week, so I'm not doing no, no interview. They talking about come up there. She's like, boy, are you crazy? You are doing the interview. Get there. Email, no, email them back. You don't have to go, but you're doing it in my office. Right. That's what's up. So man. I'm like, man, damn. So... I do follow her instructions because, you know, she liable to do anything to me. I go in her office. We, we eventually have the interview. I'm bullshitting through the interview. All right. She give me the look. Tighten up. Like now. Tighten up. Give this your all. So the interview, you know, it ends well. They offer me the job. I'm still thinking, man, I ain't moving no damn Virginia. Right. I say it's God because all three of my other job offers fell through. Wow. And that's the last one standing. Last one. Yeah. We got a start date for you, September 11th, 2009. You can come on up. So my cousin uh, packed up, me and my cousin, we packed up the U-Haul. My other cousin came up from Atlanta, from, from Atlanta Beach rather, came up. Uh, I drove my car, my cousin drove the U-Haul, my other cousin drove his car so they could get back. Right. We drive to Charlottesville, I'm just looking around, and they like, yo, you sure? Like, we can go back if you want, like, you good? I had just got an apartment, paid the deposit. I'm like, yeah, let's let's just see what's what. And um, my grandmother had told me, like, she's like, you're gonna move to Virginia. And I'm like, yes, ma'am. And she says, uh, you know, you've always been brave. Mm. So go up there and, and do what you're supposed to do because there's something up there for you. And I moved up and uh, within a year, I had um, started a boxing club, linked up with the Boys and Girls Club. We had doing, we were doing some things in this particular uh, public housing site called West Haven. We had started doing. And this is like, all outside of your job. All outside of my job, yeah. which led me to uh, so get an interview. So you go to Charlottesville, yeah. and you find the hood immediately. I mean, yo, so listen, this is the thing. <laughs> so Charlottesville, the city is only 19% black. Okay. The county is only 9% black, 9 to 10%, depending on the day. So I was literally asking every black person I saw, where are the black people? Because wow. I'm coming from Atlanta yeah. and then from yeah. HBCU, yeah. and I'm around blackness all the time, and now I'm seeing no black people. There yeah. were only like six black people that worked in my job. 
So I'm asking them, like, yo, where are the black people? I'm at 7-Eleven, I'm at Kroger, wherever I'm at. Where are the black people? And they would laugh like they're around. <laughs> Found a church. The church, I go to the soul food spot across the street, Mel's. He's closed on this Sunday. He's like, yeah, you're not from here, are you? I'm like, no, sir. <laughs> He's like, we're not open on Sundays. Come back tomorrow. I come back tomorrow, the next day. He feeds me every day for three months straight. Wow. He's like, you don't know how to cook. I'm like, no, sir. <laughs> come here every day at 7. I got a meal for you. Wow. He fed me every day for three months straight. And then wow. I started meeting people. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I started finding, OK, so the hood is right here. Oh, this, this is odd because it's all ducked off. The, the neighborhoods, the public housing sites are all hidden off the main roads. Started just kicking it, volunteering. The news does a story on me about this new guy trying to do community work. My boss at my job sees it. He says to me, you know, I saw you on the news last night. You should probably spend more time at your job trying to figure out what you're doing oh, wow. than being out in the community. Okay. And I knew at that point that wasn't a place for me. Yeah, yeah. So I actually applied to go to, to oh, those. And, yeah, wait, go wait. Ahead. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. It's crazy, right? Yeah. So a government worker. Government worker. And it's not like, you know, this dude's not a, like a CEO or something. No. Like, government worker mm -hmm. comes at you on some foul shit. Yeah. Like, Get back to focusing mm -hmm. on this job. This your job. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this yeah. your job. This is what you need to be doing. Yeah. We got you here. Stay in your place. Yeah, basically, because yeah. I was the most junior member there. So a team of like 15 of us or whatever. He's like, yeah, hell am I seeing you on the news? You need to be here doing your work. Right. Crunching these numbers, finding out, you know, and I'm it's like, this isn't a place for me. Now, I love my salary, but hated the job. And I had uh, decided I was going to take the LSAT. I was going to go to law school. Took the LSAT, did pretty decent. Got into a few different law schools, but it was the same time I had just started the boxing club. So I'm building these, building this rapport with people in the community, with these kids, and now it's almost time to go to law school. Our superintendent um, at the time, and an assistant principal at the high school came to me, and they're like, you know, you've been doing community work. We hear you about to go to law school. You don't need, we don't need more lawyers. We need teachers. Like yeah. you saying, you want to do community work. You need to be here in the classroom. So I said, uh, I ain't really trying to be no teacher, bro. Like, that ain't, that ain't it. I'll try it until it's time for me to go off to law school because I, I had a, a year, basically, to, mm -hmm. to go. I started teaching, fell in love with it, deferred. Elementary school? High school. High school, okay. Teaching well, computer teaching. science. Okay. Yeah, fell in love with it. More so than teaching the computer science, but being in the building with the kids. Yeah. We had uh, four black teachers at the time, two black males. So I'm like 23, yeah. um, start coaching AAU basketball at the same time. So now, like all the youngins from the area I'm interacting with. Right. Got the boxing club, so it's really my life is just predicated around being in the community and be around the way. I couldn't leave that. Yeah. I couldn't disappoint these people who had kind of took me in. So we get to the point about like, all right, well, are you going to run for office or not? It's being whispered like, yeah, we don't have any black people on the city council. You should run. And I'm in a master's program to, to be a principal. And I'm like, nah, that ain't really what I want to do until it was like, well, why not? So wait, wait, let's back up. Yeah. As a classroom teacher, yeah. you saw a space where you could climb through the administration of the school system. Yeah, yeah. And so you went to school to pursue that. Mm -hmm. Break that down. So, so for me, it was one thing being in the classroom, but I was consistently the black teacher, the black male teacher that all the black kids came to their class and when the white teachers were having issues with the black students, they just and sent yeah. them to my class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, go down there with Bellamy. Or, <laughs> you know, go down there and, like, you know, let, let Bellamy deal with you and talk some sense into you, and then you come back. Yeah. Or during lunch period, instead of me having, you know, five or ten kids in my class just chilling, I got 40 or 50 right. young black males and, and black females in there just hanging out because this is their safe space. Okay. And uh, as the years were going by, I was slowly understanding that, like, you can do some things as a teacher, but you can set policy from not only a council perspective, but from an administrative perspective being inside the school. So when I went and got my master's um, in, in education, administration, and supervision, I intentionally wanted to be at an HBCU. And uh, so I had to drive 90 miles one way to Virginia State University 
passed up going to UVA, passed up going to VCU, passed up going to University of Richmond to be in that space where I was with my people. And, you know, some folks were calling me crazy, like, damn, you driving all the way there yeah. to, to, to go to school? You, there's schools right here. But it was an intentional decision. And, and sometimes you never know what God is preparing you for. Me driving those two or three days a week to get my master's, which then I eventually went and got my doctorate at the same institution, uh, led to making the drive when I became the department chair at the school that much more easier because I was used to it. For sure. So everything always lines up. That's what's up, man. So Yeah, yeah. So the hood reaches out, they recruit a candidate, yeah. and, and, yeah. and they get you to run for city council. Yeah, yeah, what yeah. year is this? This is in 2013. Okay, yeah. so you are four years out of school, mm -hmm. boxing club is popping. Boxing club's popping, yeah. Charlottesville's adopted you as one of their own. Yeah, yeah, somewhat. And Okay. Somewhat, because I'm still not from there. Yeah. So don't get it twisted. Well, that's, a, that's the yeah, whole thing. Yeah, like, yeah. You, you take the... At that point. Now, yeah. now they're adopting me. But at that point, sure. no, nah, we, we still... Like, no, no, but that's the interesting thing, because you end up being the black district mm -hmm. representative, and you're not from there. Mm -mm. There's lots of places I could... An ordinary cat would say, how did you get a guy and you're not from there? Yeah. I must ask, how it wasn't no Charlottesvillian? Mm. Who was prepared for that seat? Or did you beat them? No. So I think that they're, Charlottesville is a very different place. The, the air um, of Thomas Jefferson, the mm -hmm. synergy and the energy of Thomas Jefferson um, permeates throughout. It's still there. Not no more. You know, funny. The point. Oh, we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get then, to that. Yeah, we'll get yeah, to yeah. that. You know, but there, that's, there's, echogenesis is real. Yeah. And, and, very much so. Yeah. And you, Talk to people, old school folks from Memphis, mm -hmm. who will tell mm -hmm. you that the spirit of the Lorraine Motel, mm -hmm. Motel Room 906, mm -hmm. right, is a real thing in the city of Memphis. It's a fact. Right? And so we're talking about Thomas Jefferson, one of the quote unquote founding fathers yeah. of this country. Yeah. And that, that, that Sally Hemings, yeah. that bullshit is still yeah. hanging over everything yeah. in Charlottesville. What's that feel like? Very much so. It felt different for me because I didn't grow up around That's right. that. That's right. I didn't grow up around white people having some kind of air or their energy yeah. just being around. Yeah. I grew up around black folk and more specifically. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and there's us, the, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's nothing that we can't do. Yeah. Like so so the energy and the disposition of I need to check in or maybe ask yeah. or maybe get permission yes. before doing something yeah. wasn't something that I grew that up mindset. doing. But see that's the thing. Yeah. That's what the Atlanta, the yeah. Maynard mindset yeah. doesn't allow you yeah. to ask a white power structure. Not at all for permission uh -uh. before engaging in civic affairs. Yeah, not at all. And civic leadership. Right. Right? A at all. Yeah. In fact, I'm more so it's questioning. Yeah, I'm challenging, why aren't y'all doing X, Y, yeah. and Z? And in fact, because you're not doing it, you know what, I'm tired of just asking y'all white folk to come and do yeah. whatever, I'm gonna go and do it. I think it's another interesting point. You're a southerner. Yeah. Right? Through you, and through. You're not from New York. Nah, you're not nah, from nah. Detroit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm you're not from down south. Philly. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you don't have to be from the north to have a black independent, an independent black entrepreneurial, creative, yeah. innovative mindset yeah. when it comes to politics. Yeah. And also understanding that entrepreneurship is not only regulated to business. That's right. We have social entrepreneurship yes. in which yes. you can be innovative in terms of how you create programs and new structures and or systems that benefit and or are advantageous to our people. Yeah. And yeah. that's how I viewed being in Charlottesville. I want to uh, create structures and systems in which we develop and grow our own and we do what we have to do for us. Now, there were people in Charlottesville who were doing things, who were um, in some instances pulled me under their wing, I got you, in some instances were skeptical because it's often that people will come there, say they're gonna do things, uh, extrapolate whatever they can out of the community and or resources and then leave and go to a larger place. Yeah, yeah, it, that's a that's an interesting space. Yeah, uh, my, OG, my OG tells me all the time when I first moved to Charlottesville, uh, he won a $150 bet because the over under was that I wasn't gonna be there longer than three years. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I'm mean, again, DC, yeah, yeah. Atlanta, yeah, Charlotte is popping. It's all close. Nashville's yeah, popping. Yeah, yeah. And if you're a Southern guy, it's all right there. Yeah, just go and like go back, or you know what I'm saying, go somewhere else. Yeah. But but I I felt as if why go somewhere else when we can build what we need here? Like the easy thing to do is go somewhere where it's already popping. Yeah. 
the, the challenging thing, and to me, um, what God had told me I needed to do was stay my black ass there. <laughs> and even if it's uncomfortable in the, the meantime, because people don't quite understand why I'm moving so fast or why I want to do these things so fast or why we got to do this or why we got to start this or why we got to go like this, this is what my assignment was. Right, right. And um, I ran for office the first time in 2013. I lost the election by four votes. What'd you run for? Uh, city council. Okay. So all of our seats are at large. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was a tie at the polls, the second tie in Virginia state history. Um, and I lost that first election. God really just told me it wasn't my time. Mm. But we have elections every two years. They're four-year terms, but they're staggered. So I lost that first election. People around the community, oh, man, what the hell? They cheated. West didn't win. But I also had uh, 487 people, I kept a count, who came up to me and said, Wes, I'm sorry I didn't go vote. Wow. I just thought you were gonna win. Wow. Some said it was too hot that day. 487. 487, Jeez. I lost the election by four votes. Yeah. But we needed to go through that. One, because our folks needed to understand literally every vote counts. Yeah. But secondly, and probably for the story, it was during that time, three days before the election, uh, where I truly began to understand the importance of this Confederate statue. Mm. And it was something that I didn't understand. Before. Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee. Break that down. So without losing that election, um, we, we probably would be in a different space. So in uh, 2013, the election is on June 8th, if I'm not mistaken. I'm known for throwing cookouts. Mm -hmm. We usually have two, 300 people at the cookouts, DJs, everybody pull up, whatever, right? This particular cookout, which we have at the park, it's like 70 people there. I'm like, where the hell is everybody at? Mm -hmm. Why is everybody coming to the cookout? The homeless shelter's across the street, so mainly those folks are the only people who come to the cookout. I go to church the next day, people looking at me with disgust, like, the hell? So, you know, it's the day before, it's two days before the campaign, the election, I'm going to all the churches, people, elders looking at me, shaking their head. Some want to talk to me, half talk to me. One lady pulls me to the side and she says, so I saw you in the news last night. Yes, ma'am. And she says, um, you had a, did you notice anything at the park? I'm like, yeah, where was everybody? Like, not everybody, like, and she was like, did, did you notice something that was in the park? I'm like, no, ma'am. Did you notice something in the middle of the park? You talking about the statue, that big old statue? She's like, yeah. We don't kick it there. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. And she's like, yeah. do you understand? Like, she, she really just called me on it. Like, you say you want to represent us, but do you understand what's happened at that park? Yeah. And I'm like, no, ma'am. And she begins to tell me a story of how her, her brother had his face slashed in the park, mm. how people have been spat on in that park, how people were coming. It's adjacent to a library. How people would come out, the kids would come out the library, and they couldn't go into the park. They had to sit with their backs turned and, and just hear the kids playing in that park. And the story of how the statue was erected in 1924, and there was a Klan rally that was held um, when the park was dedicated and whatnot. So now I'm like, oh, shit. So it's in my mind like, well, damn, I really messed up. But if there's ever a time in which I can do something about it, I will. I lose that election. And then subsequently, I go and sharpen my skills in terms of not only understanding the history of Charlottesville, but understanding my city's budget. We start a black professional network. We start uh, doing these seminars and classes about zoning. And my campaign, two years later in 2015, I raised the most money. Uh, I got the most votes in our city's history. I'm the first person to win all 10 precincts. Mm. It was a much well, uh, much, uh, it was a, a well-oiled machine. I was a little more mature. But also, I said to myself, yo, if there's ever an opportunity to do something about that statue, I'm going to do it. The governor, I, go I, ahead. I, 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 go ahead. I want to focus on campaign two. Yeah. Because... You were one of the first cats I remember, post Obama, mm -hmm. black folks, mm -hmm. to operationalize a data, yeah. like a data driven campaign. Yeah, right. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, in the modern campaigns, we've moved away from, I got to go to every church, I got to, you know, mm -hmm. go to every, you know, cookout. Mm -hmm. And there is a way to track data yep. using proper, you know, mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. And, and break that down because I, I want people to understand the professional practice oh, yeah. of, of what it is to do this, yeah. right? And, and, and 
to do the things you did, to be in office to remove the statue, yeah. you got to win a campaign. Yeah, and and yeah. there is a science to winning a campaign. For sure. And it seems like between 13 and 15, you figured that out. Oh, for sure. So I had a, a, I kept a tally list yeah. of everybody who I knew voted for me yeah. and everybody who told me they voted for me. And we're going to build our voter number. So we looked at the numbers in terms of from 2013, this was the win number. Okay, so we need to get 20%. We want to shoot for 20% above this win number this time around. And 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 this is all digitized. All digitized. And, and so there's yeah. a there's a database um, that we use in Virginia called the Van. Yep. Um, and we utilize the Van to analyze. Okay, these are people who are likely voters, strong Dems, um, people who have may have been not thought about, which are a lot of folks in our community. And I wanted to, again, build out our quote-unquote list. Yeah. So we used uh, very specific tactics um, starting in November of the race that was going to take place in June right. to let folks know, one, we're running, two, I need your commitment that you're going to vote for me now, and then lastly, and more than you just going and saying you're going to vote, we're going to put a campaign yard sign on January 3rd right. and up. Uh, we, what was our number? 1,200 um, uh, households or yards throughout the city of Charlottesville. Right. Now, we only needed 3,200 votes to win. And 1,200 households means? 1,200 households was equating essentially to our number was like 2,500 votes. Right, right. So now, if we got 2,500 votes off the rip, we just need to get another 700 to 1,000 to be good. But once we were able to hit our number of our 1,200 households with yard signs, which we hit on January 10th, so we were a week late, but we had our January 10th numbers of, uh, of 1,200 yard signs. Now we're going to try and go get another 2,000 right, votes. Right. So, and that's the thing that mm -hmm. you know your numbers, yep. you know your people, and now you know how to target your resources yep. for what's left out there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And <clears throat> we haven't gotten into this yet on, mm -hmm. on the pod, but folks have got to understand if you are not running a digitally data driven yeah. campaign, yeah. you kind of wasting your time. Yeah, yeah. You wasting your time. Mm -hmm. You wasting your time because in order to be effective, uh, to to enact policy as you alluded to, you got to win. Yeah. And in order to win, you have to do your research on the front end. The first campaign uh, in 2013, I, I tied just based off of charisma. Yeah, yeah. I didn't have the the institutional knowledge. I didn't know about zoning, didn't right. know our budget, didn't understand those things. I just had a lot of charisma. I'm young and he's black and there's no black people on the council. Let's bet on that. Didn't work. Really close, mm -hmm. but it didn't work. Two years later, I wanted to show, not only did I mature as a candidate and as an individual, but I wanted to show that I really know my shit. Yeah. So everything about our budget, the, the, the $225 million budget that we had at the time, from the from the rooter to the tutor, as we say down south, <laughs> yeah. I knew. Yeah. Yeah. Line yeah. items yeah. galore, I knew. Mm -hmm. I had took and literally studied for about 18 months, three years worth of budgets. And in the budget that was going to be passed, I knew it. So when I was going into campaign meetings or meet and greets or talking to people about things I want to see uh, done or things that they want to see done, oh, well, you want to be able to, to have new infrastructure for sidewalks? Well, this is how much we spent on it before, and this is how much it'll cost moving forward. We want to do affordable housing. We want to do public housing redevelopment. This is how much we've spent before. This is how much it'll cost. Like, I knew those numbers, and then I also knew my win number right. in the community. I also wanted to, uh, I had a strong team, man, really strong team, and we set out to all the people who folks said that you shouldn't spend this time in these communities oh, yeah. or yeah, these yeah. pockets because they're not going to vote. Wesley just showed you 487 people told you they didn't vote. There's no need to rely on them. No, we're going to have a campaign specific for them to ensure that they come out as well. And again, it all turned out well. We won all 10 precincts. We swept them all. So you win election for the first time in November of 2016. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, 15. Mm -hmm. You go into 2016 an elected official. Yep. And... Typically, the person who gets the most votes, you got the most votes citywide. Mm -hmm. Typically, the person who gets the most votes ends up being the mayor. Yeah. What, what happened there? You did not end up being the mayor. Yeah, so I declined the mayorship okay. um, and accepted the role of the vice mayor because I was in my doctoral program. Okay. So I knew that that was just going to be a whole lot to, to handle and navigate. And I knew like, shit, you young, you black, you the vice mayor, bro, you still gonna be popping. Like it's, right. I don't need necessarily the title to be able to do what I need to do. Let's be able to, to, to get through this doctoral program. So you're the sitting vice mayor, mm -hmm. you got the boxing club, yep. you come out the classroom, everybody knows who you are. Mm -hmm. And 
you've got some friends in politics at yeah. this point. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, our, our buddy down the road in Richmond. Yeah. Break that down. So uh, me and my man, LeVar Stoney, shout out to the honorable mayor of yeah. Richmond. Uh, we become really cool. Governor McAuliffe and I become cool. And we start talking about, you know, like, well, what are some of the things that you want to do when you're in office? And um, there was a young lady, Zayana Bryant. She was a 15-year-old freshman, a 14-year-old freshman in her class, was talking to me the year before about, you know, West man, I really want to get those statues removed. Like, we're doing a class project about it. And I'm saying to her, like, oh, you should write a petition. Because people had been, you know, spray painting the statues. I had my incident uh, two years before with people telling me about why they wanted the statues removed. And I'm thinking, like, okay, this is perfect. Uh, a young lady, this is a class assignment or class project. This will really, you know, really like kick off and be the catalyst for us removing these statues. So when I'm having a conversation with Governor McAuliffe, he's like, okay, well, if that's something you want to do, like, uh, pay attention, but are you sure what comes with that? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, bro, like, I'm, I'm sure to be knew. fine. Like, he, he knew. Okay. He knew, like, yo, this is this is still Virginia. This is the South. Um, and LeVar Stoney, Stoney, who was serving as the uh, Secretary of the Commonwealth, um, which essentially is the person who's responsible for the appointments and things of that nature uh, to state boards. He's like, yo, you're a teacher. Uh, we need some young energy. I want to appoint you to the State Board of Education. Okay. So now I'm the vice mayor, uh, the youngest person ever elected, most votes, and then I'm on the State Board of Education. <laughs> I'm the only black person on the state wait, board. Wait, wait, wait. I want to be clear about this. Is let's establish the dynamics. Yeah. So you get more votes mm -hmm. than the mayor. Yep. But you're the vice mayor. Yep. But the mayor knows you got more votes than the mayor. Yeah, I got more votes than everybody. And and you're super young. Yeah. You fly. You run. This is when I kind of start yeah. to become aware yeah. of who you are. Yeah. You're wearing bow ties. Wearing bow ties everywhere I go. I know you're a noob. You're yeah. sharp everywhere you go. Yeah. And the governor appoints you to the State Board of Education. Yeah. This is usually something that's for old, <laughs> old, old older folks. Yeah, for sure. Right? You know? For sure. And they're usually white. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, 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 yeah. And so... Just to be clear, you come out of nowhere, your first time elected, and within a matter of months, you're three months. A sitting three months. Mm -hmm. You're a sitting city councilor at large. Mm -hmm. You're the vice mayor, and you're on a state board of education, yep. leapfrogging all the administrators that were effectively in the school. Yeah, that you yeah, came yeah. I'm now their boss. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it is a crazy dynamic. Yeah, and people were coming to me. I remember the mayor coming to me uh, saying, like, "Yo, how did you get on the state board of education?" And because he actually had was, you know, high up in the Democratic Party one time, Mike Signer, he had ran for a lieutenant governor, didn't win um, and had these relationships like and he's like, how did you do that? And me, honestly, I'm not understanding the significance of it. Right, right, right. I'm like, oh, yeah, I mean, we this is like shit. I mean, we cool and. Uh, shit, they asked me. I, I'm yeah. always going platinum. Yeah, like, yeah, right. <laughs> shit, yeah, yeah. I should, I should platinum and the shit the record sale, bro. I don't know. <laughs> so people in the schools are also like, you know, so you're on the state board of education now, like, yeah. but you're working in the school with us. Like you're like, you know, so um, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of energy around, but for me, it's just like, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. But I could also recognize, look, look, recognize, looking back on it, like there, there are some haters out there lurking. Yeah. And and then on top of this, when we say uh, Governor McAuliffe, we see rather Governor McAuliffe veto a bill that now essentially allows for localities to be able to decide what happens to Confederate monuments, war memorials as a whole. Okay. And I say, yo, we having a press conference, and we are gonna get these statues removed. Wait, 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 wait. He yeah, vetoes a, this bill. Okay, let's let's back up a let's yeah. back up a little bit. Okay, all right. So, the governor appoints you yep. to the state board of education. Mm -hmm. He no, knows. this is all in like the same week. Okay, okay. This is all in the same week. We have a press conference stating that we're going to remove, we're going to uh, uh, begin an effort to remove the statue of Robert E. Lee. And then like... Hold on, let, 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 I just want to, I want to explore that for a little bit. Yeah. We're talking about Robert E. Lee. We're not talking about like a neo conservative. Nah, we're talking about the general. This is the the guy, right? Yo, and, someone and said is... to me that Robert E. Lee is the second greatest person to ever walk the earth, and the first person could walk on water. My lord, that, literally. <laughs> that's how they that, feel. That's, that's, that, literally, this, my lord. literally, my lord. This is how people revere Robert E. Lee. Did you? You from the A? Yeah, Stone Mountain. I understand all the, the Stone Confederate Mountain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go to did you did you appreciate the gravity of what you were trying to tackle by removing these statues? No. Okay. No. When did you come to understand what you were really taking on? 
Okay, so there's a very interesting uh, caveat to all of this, right? So Governor McAuliffe is saying, yo, okay, you're saying you want to remove these statues. Do you recognize and understand what this means? I'm like, yeah, we want to move some statues. He's like, no, you're not getting it. This is going to be a really big deal. I'm saying to him, you know, respectfully, I'm not saying it. I'm just thinking in my mind, like, this dude don't know what he's talking about. Like, <laughs> it's not like that around here. This isn't this isn't Mayberry. Right. People don't act like that around here. Charlottesville's 80 percent Democrat. I got the most votes. It's probably going to be a very short thing. My city manager, who was black, pulls me in and he's like, you know, Wes, I just want you to understand this is going to really be a challenge. I'm like, OK. My, my sister, Kristen uh, Sekas, who served on the city council with me, she led an effort two years prior to remove, uh, for the city to no longer celebrate Lee Jackson Day. Yeah. So when I talked to her about like, yeah, we gotta move the statue, like you saw what happened uh, down the General Assembly, she was with it, but she's like, Wes, I just want you to know, you're gonna get most of the vitriol, because yeah. you see what they said and did to us when we just said we were no longer celebrating the day. But to me, all that was, was people just coming to the city council meeting and they maybe sent a couple emails. I'm like, yeah, I ain't yeah, really, yeah, yeah. I'm really worried about that, that shit. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I'm not dealing, I'm not worried about that. So I didn't understand the gravitas or the gravity of it all until um, it's March 16th, 2022. It's a Tuesday. We usually play basketball um, up at UVA at 6 a.m. And then we lift weights uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So the governor is like, yo, I'm sending state troopers to go with you. Um, they're going to be with you. They're going to your house Monday night because you're at a city council meeting and then they're going to go to you. They're going to go with you to your house. Wherever you go, they're going all day. So I'm like, bro, it's going to look mad awkward. Like we go in the gym and we hooping and the state troopers because in there. Because this is the day he's vetoing. No, this is the day of the press conference. He's already vetoed okay. the bill. So this is the day where we're, you know, having what the bill press did he conference. Veto? He vetoed um, essentially this bill that, that stated uh, that war memorials prior to the year of 1995 could not be removed without state approval. Okay. There was no law on the books at the current time that said you couldn't remove them. Only war memorials that were post-1995. Okay. Got it. So effectively, to remove the Confederate statues, you are doing this as a city authority. Correct. Right. And you and, and he's he's saying, well, the, the legislature has passed a bill saying that the state has authority over these. Right. Only memorials post 1995. Right, right, right. So anything before. So it is a local matter. Yeah. However, this individual who was in the state house, if I'm not mistaken, from Danville, wanted to sew up, if you will, the ability for states to not be able to do so. Got you. Got so you. so when he vetoes that bill because it had passed in the House and the, the Senate. Mm -hmm. So when he vetoes that bill, he now further uh, permeates the thought, if you will, that localities have the right to remove these statues. Gotcha. So I had already, we had made the announcement and the word had kind of got out that there's this press conference taking place in Charlottesville because they're going to do this. So again, he's like, the state troopers got to go with you. We in the gym at 6 a.m. They're there. I'm like, bro, it's just like my friends already make fun of me because they're like, this is West Bellamy, yeah. you know, and we just hooping, it's a, it's, you know, but... They with me. I go work out. I'm going to lift weights. They're there with me. Like it's 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 awkward. So I'm like, whatever. I get in the car. I usually listen to Jeezy. You know, everybody know this is this this is my man. This is my homie. Um, I'm in the car. I'm driving from the gym to the park, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, it's probably gonna be you know 50 people out there, whatever. We be some people for, some people against. But as I'm pulling up in downtown, I'm seeing just droves of Confederate flags. And it's at that point where it hit me like, oh, shit. They, they hear. Like. They didn't like this. Okay, this is the shit that they were talking about. Like, yeah. all right, it's real. But now, I'm like, well, bruh, you here. Like, ain't nothing yeah. here. Like, you in it. You, we can't be like, okay, we're going home. Like, yeah. so I get out the car. I just finished listening to some snowman. I get out the car, and I'm like, bruh, <laughs> I done been through a lot worse shit than politics. I'm not about to let this shit scare me. So we get out the car. It's probably about 200, 250 people there. It's probably about 150, 200 people with the Confederates on the Confederate side, probably about 50, 75 people um, who are pro statue removal. And when I get out the car, this, this dude from the Confederacy, his name was Wesley, too. He walks up to me. He's like, my name is Wesley, just like yours. And I want to shake your hand. I just want you to know I respect the community stuff you do. We disagree on this. I'm the current colonel of the Sons of the Confederacy. We disagree on this issue, but I like the work you do. Can we take a picture? We take a picture. So I'm like, oh, shit. 
it ain't gonna be nothing at all. Like, these motherfuckers is actually kind of nice. Mm. Mm. He ended the conversation with, I just want you to know that the people over there don't represent what I believe. So I'm like, okay, that's odd. We got the podium set up, we got the mic set up. Zayana, the young lady who wrote the petition, she speaks first and it's, you know, it's, it's okay. Another speaker from UVA, it's okay. A third speaker, my sister, Amy Sarah Marshall, she was the, the leader, the president of the Pride Association. And she talks about her being from Alabama and as a gay woman, as soon as she says that, they start booing. Mm -hmm. So she finished her speech, but I take the mic. I'm like, yo, we're not out here for that. Like, we're gonna be respectful. So they're like, okay. But that had really ticked off our NAACP president, Emmer Turner, Dr. Turner. So Dr. Turner, we had, you know, he's known to be a firecracker. He goes up and he says, um, my name is Dr. Emrick Turner. I'm the leader of the baddest and boldest civil rights organization in the world, the NAACP. And this statue belongs in the trash. <laughs> and bruh, it goes all the way up. They wow. yelling, they arguing. My pastor speaks, Kristen speaks, Kristen Seiko speaks, and I'm last. And while I'm speaking, they're trying to drown me out. They calling me every name you could think of. I'm a communist, N-word traitor let us speak so i turn my back to them and i'm now i'm just speaking to my supporters we finished the press conference i get in the car and i'm actually supposed to be doing a recruiting trip for albemarle county public schools in hampton so i'm saying to myself like damn yo that was a little crazy but it's a good thing we got this trip planned the same day i can get away for a little bit my phone is going crazy all the social media is going crazy but I'm thinking I'm removing myself. So we go at Hampton University, we're recruiting, trying to get teachers, nobody there really knows what happened. It's an overnight trip. So usually when I'm there, I go hook up with my homies, we go out, whatever. I'm just like, nah, I'm just chilling today. <laughs> like this shit this morning was crazy. Bro, I turn on the news, you asked me the question how I knew this shit was crazy, I turn on the news, I see me on the news in Hampton. What the fuck, go to the next channel, I'm on the news. <laughs> the next channel, I'm on the news. So I'm like, yo, this shit is statewide? Right. Open my social, 10,000 mentions, look on Twitter, all these mentions, Facebook, all these, I see people recorded it, all these people talking. And then I'm like, all right, this is the shit that they were talking about. I start getting bombarded with emails, and it's on. But now I have to tell myself that, okay, we believe in this and Jeezy has this, this quote, he has this, this thing on Trap or Die, there's an interlude at the end and he talks about his definition of a gangster. And he says, like, I don't think a gangster is a person with gold teeth, braids, or any of that. A gangster is a person who stands up for what he believes in. Mm -hmm. A gangster is a person who every day looks himself in the mirror and, and stands up for the values and the principles that he holds. Mm -hmm. A gangster is a person who doesn't step down. So if you think you got a little bit of money or you earned a couple stripes and that make you a gangster, you wrong. You got a live it this isn't a title this is a way of life mm -hmm. that's what a gangster is to me and i just started thinking in my mind like nah this is the realest shit that you can do stand up for what you believe in stand up for that lady who told you two years ago Man. that her face was slashed her brother's face was slashed in the park stand up for those people because the a couple the sunday before we had the the press conference i go i'm going to the churches and black folk are telling me wes don't you have that press conference leave those statues alone these people will kill you about that and I almost want to cry. People I look up to, people who are my mentors, they're so afraid yeah. of what may happen. Yeah. They saying, just leave it alone. No, I got to stand up for them. And we did. And now you see the statues melted. So August 11th and 12th, 2017. Yeah. You are the sitting vice mayor of Charlottesville when the entire world changes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tiki Torch riots. Yeah. On, on October, excuse me, on August 11th uh -huh. of 2017. Yeah. The following day, but let's get into the Friday night of yeah. the Tiki Torch riots. Jews will not replace us. Yeah. White supremacists, white shirts, khaki pants. Yeah. Marching through downtown Charlottesville. Uh -huh. And you are a sitting elected official yeah. at this moment. Across the street, watching them. Yeah. Trying to get active with them. What is this like? How, how does this, 
everything. Yeah, well, for me, you can't talk about August 11th and 12th without backing up to November of 2016, where for me it all started. So, like, I began getting calls on Thanksgiving of 2016 in which people are saying, you dumb black nigger, we're going to take everything that you have ever accomplished. Everybody thinks you're Dr. King. We're going to show them who you are. And I had wrote during my, when I was 18, 19, 20, 21, some of the craziest, most disrespectful, wildest things that we think are funny on Twitter. Okay. And now I'm, I'm 30 years old, if you will, 30, 31, and these tweets from 10 years back, from you know, eight, nine, 10 years back, are resurfacing. Tweets that are homophobic, they are uh, prejudiced, they are just just downright sexist, just just dumb shit yeah. that you're so saying I, when you're so young. I, I, I've seen the tweets. Yeah. And- you was wilding on Twitter. Oh, I was wilding on Twitter, which is some of the things I tell my youngest today. Yeah. Yo, watch what you say online because not all of you are going to be as lucky as me yeah. to have a community to rally around you. But let, let, let's get back. So I think it's important to establish, and, and you've apologized. Yeah. Um, like I said, you was, wilding, accountability. you was wilding on Twitter. Yeah. You've taken full accountability. And it's one thing I like. You've taken, you've owned it. Yeah. You ain't said I was hacked or nothing. No, 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 no. You've owned it. You've taken full accountability and you've acknowledged that this was a different time in your life. You were far less mature. Yeah. yeah. And you've acknowledged that the things you were saying on Twitter at the time were yeah. unacceptable. Not taking them down, not right. running from it. I, own, I want you to see the evolution I, of a man. But I think it's, a, that, that's real. I think it's important to acknowledge what was Twitter at that time? Oh. We're talking about <laughs> 08, 2008, 2009, 2010. It was a cesspool. Yeah. It, was, it was worse than what it is now. I mean, people, people saying, again, the wildest things without filters that you can think of because you think it's funny. It, it, but, but it was almost a... A less politically correct space, like the 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 era in which we were in, was a lot different. Yeah. People just said raunchy and crazy things, and then especially when you're so immature, you're saying whatever you want because you think like it's crazy. It was kind of like the beginning of like Black Twitter finding For its sure. legs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know oh, I mean? definitely and, the beginning and, of Black Twitter. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was a space where it was almost like a space for like emerging black comedy. Yeah, yeah right? exactly, exactly. And not that the things you were saying were appropriate. It wasn't but, cool at all. Yeah. It was funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was kind of the space that black Twitter was in at that time. A lot of people saying, yeah, I agree. That's right. right. You know what I'm saying? Oh, wow. You know, and and people are not even thinking nothing of it. Right. But again, it's important for us to grow as men. We're on a consistent path of evolution. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with you taking accountability for when you make a mistake, you own it and you grow. But also understand when you make mistakes, you will have to atone atone for them. And for me, it was Jason Kessler now coming and saying, aha, you want to take our statues down. Who's Jason Kessler? Jason Kessler is the gentleman who led the Unite the Right rally, the white supremacist rally that eventually had someone drive through um, and and kill someone, uh, Heather Heyer, led the effort for Jews when so, so, and so, forth. so so you wilding on Twitter as a younger man. Yeah. You've evolved, you've become this community leader, you've yeah. been selected official. Yeah. And part of your platform, not mm-hmm. your whole, but part of your platform is removing these white supremacist, racist, Confederate statues mm-hmm. from your city. Yep. And folks find you, yep. right? And say, Well, look, you're not qualified to talk mm-hmm. about removing these statues. Because look what you said on yeah, Twitter, yeah, right? Yeah, this and is who so, you really are. Yeah, this is No matter how long ago it was, this yeah. is who you really are. Right, So right. we got to atone and deal with that. And I mean, that made me, I had to resign from uh, serving as a State Board of Education, had to resign um, in, in, in title from my position uh, as a teacher. And uh, I stayed, remained on the city council, the community, really rallied and said he will not be removed, they won't take him away. And that's really what made Jason Kessler and then eventually Richard Spencer and others really upset because they took me to court, tried to have me petition to be removed, and when they saw they couldn't, they said that they were going to lead the largest uh, pro-white and right rally that the nation had ever seen. So (laughs) the Mm -hmm. whole Tiki Torch riot is because of your tweets. Because of my tweets. Wow. So they show up in Charlottesville. Yep. As a let's talk about the practical nature of being an elected official when crisis happens yeah. in your city. What is the warning you get? What is the <laughs> you know what type of security? Yeah. Because you know Klansmen are descending upon your city. Yeah. What does that feel like? Are you getting texts from oh, security man. from your police department? I, yeah. Walk us through that. So so the first 
rally, Tiki Torch rally happens on Mother's Day, May of 2017. That evening, there were about a hundred. about that. Yeah, so about a hundred white supremacists led by Richard Spencer, dressed in white shirts, khaki pants. They go and surround the statue with the Tiki Torches from Walmart, trying to be intimidating to the people in the community. So I get that call from our city manager, like, yo, I just want you to know this is going on. My social media is blowing up. Our police chief, yo, if you can, Wes, stay from down there because you know that you're public enemy number one. I go anyway. So uh, <laughs> we go, I, I, I go, I pull up over there, I'm across the street and I'm basically like, okay, I see y'all like, you know, we have our words, the police come, they, they disperse and, and that's that. But I then encourage our Commonwealth attorney or district attorney in other localities to bring charges on them because in Virginia, there's an anti-intimidation law. Okay. And them using tiki torches is uh, similar to fire and akin, and in my personal estimation, things in which we saw in prior days with the Klan. Our Commonwealth attorney chose and decided not to bring forth charges. I was really disappointed. So then in June, uh, excuse me, in July of that same year, we, 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 of what we call the summer of hate, I get a call from my police chief saying that on your one year wedding anniversary, um, I was married during the time, your one, one year wedding anniversary, the Klan has put in a petition to come uh, to Charlottesville. I then begin to get calls. This will be a one year wedding anniversary you'll never forget. So I leave. Wait, wait, wait. You yeah. got a call oh, from the five, clan. Five, ten calls from the clan. This, this will be a wedding anniversary you'll never forget since you want to take statues down. Mm. So this is in the midst of bomb wait, wait, threats. I just want to be clear. Mm -hmm. So the attacking of your personal character yeah. via Twitter yeah. um, and the personal threats to you and your household mm -hmm. is ultimately because you said you wanted to take statues down. This is the personal price you're paying for one to take down Confederate statues. The statues being taken down, and then we got something passed called the equity package, where I wrote a bill, which was essentially four and a half to five million dollars in resources for underserved communities, i.e. black folk. Uh, 2.5 to five million dollars for public housing redevelopment, a million dollars to our African American Heritage Center, $50,000 for uh, GED training, $50,000 for you to go and take classes at our community college, $250,000 for anybody who is uh, socially disadvantaged, aka black, to get up to a $30,000 loan at 1% interest rate to either start your business or scale up your business. Okay. So see, not only were we doing the symbolic of removing the statues, my colleagues kept saying nobody cares about the statues because they want the substantive. Well, we were able to get both. And that's where the political maneuvering has to come in because I didn't have the votes initially to get the statues removed. Five person council, we only had two votes. But that same person who beat me in that election two years earlier said to me, if you can convince them to pass your budget amendment, your budget, uh, your, your budget bill, your equity package, then I'll change my vote from abstention to having the statues removed. And when we got that, we got that, boom, boom. And then they get even more upset. Okay, okay. So August 11th, 11th, the same day I defend my dissertation, <laughs> the day in which I become Dr. West Bellamy at Virginia State in the morning at 12 noon, I defend, we pass it. People are saying to me, you don't really look too happy for somebody who just becomes doctor. And I'm like, nah, it's about to be hell back in my city. Drive back to Charlottesville, my family has to leave. Um, so I'm there and you could just feel it in the air. There was a church service that night um, and while we're all in the church service, we begin to be surrounded by the white supremacists. And then across the street from us uh, at the University of Virginia, there's a statue of Thomas Jefferson. Um, the, the Tiki Torch people then lead a rally across the steps and into the streets. And I'm there with, um, you know, we got security, but more importantly, my brothers and my best friend and Barbara. He's like, yo, I'm like, yo, we're going over there. And he's like, no, because we go over there we know we're both gonna be prepared to die. We're gonna be prepared to inflict a lot of harm and we gotta live for tomorrow. Yeah. So Cooler Hairs prevailed in that regard. And I remember it's like a movie driving home where I couldn't go home, but driving to the safe location that they had me at and looking in my rearview mirror of just fire of them walking around with the tiki torches. So the next morning we have uh, Cornell West, Dr. West come to my church and we have a sunrise service. And while we're there, I'm just fired up. And I'm like, yo, today is the day. Like, it's up. And when I see one of them, it's up. Now, the governor 
had made me promise and the state troopers had made me promise that after I gave my speech, cause I was due to speak at the park, I had to leave and go down south. Like they, they mandated that. So I told them, okay, yeah, I'm gonna do it. I go give my speech, we're in the park and I'm rallying my people, it's like a troop. It's like, it's like, it's like rallying up my troops rather. And then we start seeing them coming in and they're looking at me, they're pointing like, there he is right there, but I'm surrounded by one, my homies who are like literally surrounding me. They strapped up and then state troopers in like a five point kind of star walking me to my vehicle and then they escort me out. And all I did was really spin the block. I just spin the block for an hour, came back and I'm in it. And what's so ironic about that day is that like while we got chaos going on downtown, rallies, all these things are going on, literally a mile away, a bunch of brothers are having our back to school bash. Wow. And there are about two or 300 black folk wow. in Tonska Park and the brothers are protecting the park up front and they protected me and all the kids and these babies. And we giving out our black to school bash supplies, book bags, feeding hot dogs, hamburgers, DJ and so forth. So it's really like the tale of two Charlottesvilles. When you see the fighting going on in all the, the cameras, you see some black folk, but you see a lot of white people. Right. Most of the black folk were at the park. Man. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it was just a hectic day and rest in power to Heather Heyer. But, but after all of that, I feel as if we truly ripped the Band-Aid for America to see that racism and white supremacy is still here. When 45 calls me the next day or that Monday, he doesn't ask me about, you wait, know. Wait, 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 45, Trump. Yeah, y'all's president, y'all's 45th president. Yeah, yeah y'all's president, yeah. Trump, calls you when specifically. He, when he calls the mayor and I, he calls the mayor and then he calls me. When he calls me he doesn't ask me about like you know how's the city doing how are you doing he says to me can you stop calling me 45 on television wow you see what i'm saying well he's talking to you I'm talking to me why he do you keep calling me 45 on tv really i'm like because that's your that's what you are i'm not calling you, you president I'm, I'm you're not my president i'm calling you 45 and what's he say he, something ignorant as usual and basically the phone conversation ends okay but i mean like like those are when we're talking about white supremacy white folk some white folk rather feel so entitled that that this is what they believe that they have the ability to do take over a city attack its citizens all in the name of what they say is a statue but it's really about them upholding their belief that they are better than everyone else and how dare this black boy this young man challenge our statue. They're willing to go to the depths of killing someone to be able to uphold what they believe. And unfortunately, for many of the quote unquote liberals, who too, and who also were fighting against me when we're saying that we need to remove these statues, it took someone dying for them to truly understand all of the things that we were saying before. And then we truly had a, a push and an effort, if you will, um, to remove the statues. And, and subsequently, a year later, um, we had to go endure a court case. We put tropes over them. And then eventually, two years later, we were able to have them removed. And then just this year, they were melted down. I saw that was maybe two weeks ago. Yeah, last week. Man, that was an amazing photo you got on top of yeah, it. Yeah, I'm the only person to ever stand on the, the, the statue of Robert E. Lee or the base of the statue. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't even there, you know, kind of, I'm a firm believer that God orchestrates everything for a reason, kind of like Moses. He didn't get a chance to see his people uh, go to the promised land, but, you know, he knew the work in which he put in. I wasn't there the day when the statues were removed. Shout out to my brother, Devon Henry. I was out of town, but I was able to have my own quiet time with no one else around the next day that night when I got back in town and had my own moment. And as I was jogging all those years, looking that statue in the eye, saying, yo ass is gonna be up out of here, yeah. I know it, cause I could physically see it and everybody telling me I'm crazy, that day came. Wow, that's amazing, man. Congrats to you, man. Love, bro. <laughs> you got it down. Love, we, we got it down, we, we got, got it down. down. Yeah. Tell me about, at some point, after leaving office, Yeah. Um, job's done. Job is done. Yeah. <laughs> you founded a political party. Yeah. Our Black Party. Our Black Party. Tell me how that came about, yeah. why you did it, and ultimately, 
what was your end game or what is your end game? Yeah. Tell me about the status of the Black Party today, yeah. why you did it, and why you think it's important. One of the most challenging things that I've ever been a part of, and I didn't found it solo by myself. You know, shout out to my dear sister Candace Hollingsworth, our national co chair, former mayor of Highsville, Maryland. We had a committee, a, a board, if you will, Stephanie Morales, Commonwealth Attorney from Portsmouth, um, Rashad Lambert from Philly, uh, uh, several folks who, who played very instrumental roles in us getting us off the ground. And so many people right but for me as I was traveling the country and people were inviting me to come and talk about political power how we were able to get the equity package how we were able to get the statues removed I just realized that it wasn't enough for us to consistently just give our vote away it wasn't enough for, to, the to the Democratic Party it wasn't enough for us to not be courted outside of election season it wasn't enough for us to just say, okay, we're just gonna do and go along because we don't have anything else for us to, to be a part of. And black folk, in my personal estimation, are really politically homeless mm -hmm. in many ways. We, we need a home. We, many of us have believed that the Democratic Party is advantageous for us. And in many ways, they're more advantageous than the, than the Republican Party, but that doesn't make them um, a, a good party for our people specifically. And my thought was that there's nothing Nothing wrong with black folks setting our own agenda. There's nothing wrong with black folks saying that we are going to put ourselves first. The same way in which we see other communities and ethnicities across the globe put themselves and their political values first. So when we started our black party, it was an idea that I knew would take a lot of work, and that's where we are right now. Still putting the infrastructure and the pieces together because when you think about trying to mobilize black folk from across the country to not only break away from a specific ideology that they've known for so long but also the money that's necessary to get on the ballots mm -hmm. encouraging people to say try something new and you run with this particular backing but then also just more than anything else shifting the paradigm it's hard work but it's something that I believe can and will be done and, and, and it probably should but yeah to the degree that you and I have been in this game a long time yeah it's hard and it's tough because yeah. we understand that we exist in a two-party system that's it so tell me what is on the Our Black Party agenda yeah. that you feel is not properly represented or pushed mm -hmm. in the Democratic Party. So for me, the local and state levels, we have to have more attention, resources on the ground, education from a political education standpoint, and then candidates who are willing to boldly say, I'm for and I love everybody, but I'm about putting my people in our agenda first. Mm -hmm. Those are the things in my personal estimation that are missing. I think uh, national electoral politics are one thing and eventually you know, we can get there, but the political education that's needed on the ground, forget running, just the political education of understanding how these systems work is something that is gravely missing. And we're not going to learn this from anyone else except for ourselves. So that's one of our main objectives, teaching our folks how these systems work. Then secondly, again, being bold enough to say that I will put my people first and do so with my ballot and with my policy. Mm. So teaching us again how to do that and then going forth to doing so, those are the things that are on our agenda um, in the immediate. But I, I think like everything else you've done, that doesn't come without criticism. Oh, no. When you're going into a 2020 election cycle, mm -hmm. well, I think mm -hmm. you all started. When we started, this. yeah, yeah, yeah. You gonna cost us the election? Yeah, 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 yeah. What are yeah. you doing? You gonna, cost, you gonna split? Black yeah, you gonna split? Black, yeah. What are you doing? And by the way, we're you're doing this in the cycle after a Jill Stein, right, right, right. right. And I'm old enough to remember a Ralph Nader mm -hmm. who supposedly mm -hmm. cost John Kerry. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So These third long, party candidates, yeah, if you there's will. There's a long yeah. history of third party candidates supposedly costing the yeah. Democratic Party or maybe uh, Ross Perot cost, you know, yeah. in 92, the Republican Party. Um, how were you able to have the courage to proceed with this while having to look black folks and more importantly, mainstream media in the face and saying, this may, if we grow strength, this may cost the Democratic Democratic Party the nomination. Yeah, because before you were a Democrat, before you were Republican, before you were an independent, before you had any political affiliation, you were black. Yeah. 
And again, there's nothing wrong with us but putting black first. But you have to be first. willing to look in the camera and say that yeah. and explain that. Yeah, so before you were a Democrat, before you were a Republican, <laughs> yeah, before you were an independent, before you had any political affiliation, you were black. Uh -huh. And there's nothing wrong with black folk putting our issues first, regardless of how it may make anyone else feel. I value us enough to say that I'm willing to put us first. And what that looks like is just what it looks like. I can't be concerned with who it may cost. I have to be more concerned with how it impacts my people. How do you feel like the party has progressed since you started it? And what do you see as the future of it? I see that I firmly believe that we have a, a lot of work to do um, in terms of infrastructure and more importantly political education this is a marathon it's not a sprint yeah. and as a person who's run a marathon before one of the hardest <laughs> things that i've had to do physically yeah yeah i know that you don't win or you don't finish your marathon in mile two or three yeah so yeah. this is a long run and this is something that we have to commit to honestly, for the duration of our lives. And I'm prepared and training myself and hopefully we're working with others to do just that. Run this race, not just for me, but for my daughter, mm -hmm. for your sons, for your grandkids, for our grandkids, for when Sexy Red comes out and she says that, <laughs> you know, I want to be politically engaged and understand yeah. that we have a place for her to go and understand what these systems mean. That's who it's for. So, you know, you have been in this game it doesn't seem like a long time, but actually a long time, yeah. right? And, yeah. and, and things have happened for you really quickly. But ultimately, you've centered black people in your professional universe of advocacy. Mm -hmm. And now you've taken that to an HBCU mm -hmm. where you are the chair of a political science department. Yep. Talk about how you teach the next generation of students who have signed up to play in this game, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, what does your activism and all the stuff you know look like in your classroom? Oh man, I absolutely love it. You know, in addition to serving as the chair of the political science department, um, my president, President McCall Abdullah, has blessed and allowed me to be able to begin a political institute. So we have the John Mercer Langston Institute for African American Political Leadership, which is uh, a training ground, if you will, for black politicals across the state to understand how policy policies, how running, how campaign works over a six month period of time. We meet once a month and we do intense training in different spots across the state. So not only with the Institute, but also with our department, it is of the utmost importance that we are speaking one truth to power, but more importantly, speaking truth. Mm. So when you are black and when you are in the electoral space, yep. you will not be treated like everyone else, similar to what we see in life, but more importantly, advocacy is only one component. Um, politics and, and serving in office is only one component. Being on the staff side is only one component. Working in municipal government is only one component. Mm -hmm. And we want to develop well-rounded individuals who can serve in a litany of different ways to help empower our people over the long run. So some of you will be activists on the front lines. Some of you will be lobbyists and strategists. Some of you will be city managers and, yep. and, and persons who uh, work for the local government on the staff level. Some of you will be organizers who work on a nonprofit space. But all of you will do something to support your people. And that's the thing. I, I think that people don't understand that there is an ecosystem. In this uh, absolutely. Game. Like if this was... There's rappers, mm -hmm. there's A and R's, mm -hmm. there's label heads, right. there's road managers. Right. And everybody yeah. has producers, an producers, engineers, producers, we engineers. We can't do any of it without any of them. Yeah. And and uh, the, there is an ecosystem and everybody has a role yep. in pushing black interests forward in right. this game. Right. Like, broadly in this game. You seem to have figured that out, man. I think that I've been blessed enough to work with a lot of people with a lot of different experiences who've helped show me different things. But I mean, people like yourself, uh, you know, I remember the first time I met you, Don, at a fundraiser with Mandela Barnes, who you were working with a few years back before he was running for governor of LG. Right, five, right. Yeah. Like when, when, when you were, really, I remember, you may not remember this, we were in this building in D.C. and you pulled a few of us to the side and you were breaking down how people lobby and consult. 
And those are aspects of the game that I didn't even know about. And I was elected. You see what I'm saying? So there's so many different facets of uh, influencing the political sphere that we have to uh, become um, ingratiated in yeah. and immersed in to understand how we move ourselves forward. That is to be taught. And I try to just be a sponge who learns and also a person who consistently gives it back. Man, you <laughs> speaking of giving it back, you talked about the, the boxing uh, yeah. uh, uh, clinic. The boxing club, club, yeah. The boxing club you ran. You are a somehow, some way, and I've, it's all kind of new to me because I've been watching you yeah. know, from a distance. Yeah. You are a legit fitness influencer. <laughs> I see you in Charlottesville in the dead of winter, running with no shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You lightweight thirst trapping. <laughs> in a weird way, I respect uh, you. Uh, <laughs> I mean, like, no, no. So look, people always ask me about, about running with no shirt, right? So let me just say this on the Don Callaway, you know what I'm saying? It's a brother chairman. So listen, I sweat a lot. And one of the things I learned early on while running, in all seriousness, is that when I run with my shirt on, if I run and sweat goes down my back and it's stuck to my shirt, <laughs> psychologically, I'll just stop. Like, man, F this. Yeah. I'm not doing this shit. It's yeah. cold. Like, the, the, that, I'm not having nothing stuck to So for me, take the shirt off no matter what weather you're in, whether it's hot, whether it's cold, and deal with the elements. Mm. And it's more of a mental thing of me telling my body that you're not hot and you're not cold. Similar to when we're out in the community, whatever obstacle is in front of you is not going to stop you. Run. Yeah. You, you're, you're, you said you're gonna run four miles today? Run the four miles. We're not worrying about the distractions of it being cold or sweat. Remove the distraction. Okay, you're cold, put the hand warmers on your hand and put the gloves yeah. on. Put the, the thing over your head, put the scully on and go run. Yeah. Similar to we say we're gonna lead a community endeavor, go lead it. Go do it because people are counting on you. This is the job. So, like, to me, running requires a great deal of discipline. Shout out to my man, Ballhawk. Uh, he, he has been on this push-up challenge. We have to do 25 to 50 push-ups every day. Yeah, I'm out. So, so, <laughs> so, to me, it's like the discipline of challenging yourself to hold yourself accountable to do what you said you're going to do. And it's also synonymous with life. I'm not a perfect human being. I'm still working through how to be a better man, working with my therapist, working with, you know, young men's groups and men's groups just to be a better person. But running is a consistent thing in which I can, one, hold myself accountable, but also uh, allow myself to have something to shoot for every day or at least three to four days a week that I know you're going to do this yeah. to make yourself better. You know, and that... That speaks to a certain resiliency that I wanted to um, to close with rapping with you about. Mm -hmm. um, the Twitter thing was bad. You've had a remarkable career, but mm -hmm. the Twitter thing w was a bump in the road. Mm -hmm. But the way you overcame that, you didn't let the shame or the I can't be in the game anymore or the People have canceled me, mm -hmm. so I'm done. Some I people mean, don't want to fuck with me. People yeah, don't want to yeah, fuck with yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it, you know, it cost, you a, it cost you a seat on the state board mm -hmm. event. Um, and, and you endured, you know, uh, a pretty pretty bad beat down on Twitter. Mm -hmm. But talk about how you were able to say, my public life is not done, despite having said some things I'm not proud of, right? Oh, because... A lot of yeah. folks, you know, you take that first public hit and then you retreat and you mm -hmm. fade into Bolivian, like yeah. Mike Tyson said, yeah, yeah. right? No, there's a community of people counting on me. Come on, man. Speak on it now. Like, and they don't stop counting on you because no, you tweeted something years ago. Man, listen, yeah. the, the tweets came out, I remember like the, the week of Thanksgiving, right? That Sunday, Monday. Um, it was all in the paper. So this is the last week of November. Our city council meetings are the first and third Monday of the month. So it's on everything, national news, that whole last week of November. I see a hashtag being started on Facebook, I'm with Wes, um, around like that Thursday or Friday. And seeing people start to say, you know, Wes is always there for us. We know these tweets aren't who he is yeah, anymore. Yeah. We got to be here for him. So when I got to that city council meeting that Monday and our city council chambers holds like 50 people and there are 400 people in the chambers, outside the doors and in the overflow room with signs, I'm with Wes. I got an obligation yeah. to them to continue to go. 
So, you know, in life, like the calling and your purpose is much bigger than the speed bump. Yeah. We can't allow the bump in the road or the shame of what you believe has happened to stop us from doing what our purpose is. But that only happens because you was first with them mm -hmm. and they know that. They know me. And they believe that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And and also we are not defined by our worst days. Come on, man. Yeah. In any shape, form or fashion. And, and you know what? I'm going to have more bad days. Mm -hmm. There'll be other things that I do that I'm not proud of and things that I'll have to learn from. But that's the evolution of life. We have to be patient with people and impatient with progress. Patient with people because people are always going to grow and progress at their own hold rate. Hold on, it took me a second. Hold mm -hmm. on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. That's that. The so Diggs don't do that. That's the name on. of my next the book. The Boys. Hold yeah. on, yeah, 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 yeah. Hold on, hold on. The Diggs Boys hold on, got hold you. On. The Diggs Boys. Yeah. Got me a little delayed reaction, yeah. so I'll get so back to it. patient with people, mm -hmm. because we got to give people grace. Yeah. Everybody's on a consistent uh, plane of growth and evolution. We have to be patient with people, but impatient with progress, because we got work to do no matter what. Yeah. Now, whether you come along or whether or not you messed up and you're feeling in your feelings or what, we still got work to do, and that work has to continue to be carried out. So for me, just keep going. In I find it interesting that you have chosen, even years since having left public office, you've chosen to stay at that work in Charlottesville. Yeah. You could have gone back to the A, yeah. you mm -hmm. know everybody yeah. in the game now, you know, you're a fly guy, you got all the Instagram followers, you could have gone to New York, mm -hmm. you could be in LA. Yeah. We, you and I have both lived yeah. through yeah, yeah, yeah. the Negro migration uh -huh, uh -huh, right to uh -huh, LA, right? Uh -huh. Oh yeah, uh, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You ain't right. even in DC, right? Right. right. So I'm staying where ex I'm at. explain your decision to stay in Charlottesville and, and really commit to that when you've had options. Because a lot yeah. of cats can commit to Greenville yeah. when you ain't had options. Right, right, right. right. West Bellamy is now West Bellamy. Yeah, You're yeah, the yeah, guy. Yeah. Uh, but you've really been committed to that Charlottesville community. So break that down, man. Yeah, Charlottesville is home. Mm. I may not be born and raised there, but this is home. This is where I want to raise my children. This is where the people, when a lot of folks turned their back on me, stuck with me. We have a, a history together of going through very difficult times together. And I also know that um, people need me just as much as I need them. Mm -hmm. Like folks are expecting me to do the turkey giveaway in a couple of weeks. They know this is the 11th year. Like they know the Sunday before Thanksgiving, Wes is gonna have turkeys at the park. I run this basketball league, the Tonsor League. Like people know that every Thursday and Sunday, we are gonna have 500 to 1,000 people at the park and it's gonna be safe and this is Wes's league. I call it our league and it's named after Benjamin Tonsler at Tonsler Park. Our league, our yeah. black party. Our black, this, there's, uh, there's a pattern here. Cause because blackness and, and accomplishments are not mine. Mm -hmm. They're ours. Yeah. Like what we're trying to do is build a collective. And in Charlottesville, I'm allowed to simply be me. Yeah. I don't have to be a character. I don't have to be um, Superman. I've also seen a ton of other people grow in the space and also do the work. The young folk, they uh, uh, call me. I'm like the old head now. Can you come down here and make sure things are safe? These guys run this this boxing kind of thing on Sundays. They call it knockout. And now they're calling me, Wes, make sure everything's safe. And, and you know, I'm there. Yo, y'all, all right, blah, blah, blah. Like, that's kind of my role. And I feel at peace when I'm there. Yeah. And for me, it would take a whole, 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 whole lot to leave a place where I'm peaceful. Mm. You know, as I look across the entire national landscape of the game, uh, and I know you know everybody, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Some folks. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, who got next in your mind? Um, I would say there's, a, there's actually a young brother out of D.C., um, Ty Hobson Powell. Really? Um, who's, who's helping lead the effort for D.C. becoming the 51st state. Okay. I think that issue is one of incredible importance because it can shift the electorate. Yeah. If DC is able to get statehood and have two more senators and have um, you know two more uh, House representative members, that shifts the electoral college, 
that shifts Congress. And I think it will play a pivotal role in um, presidential elections to come, which would also play a pivotal role in federal policy, which can have a trickle down effect on the state and local level. I would I would say the person or kind of movement that's next is as we see on the athletic space, like Dion uh, going from Jackson State to Colorado mm -hmm. and black players getting larger NIL, NIL deals, the movement for them to speak up politically yeah. through activism the next time, because unfortunately there will be a next time, a, a horrific event yeah. transpires pertaining to race. Yeah and how college athletes who now will not be beholden to simply, hey, I just gotta play and shut up because this is my scholarship, but I got my own money, yeah. will use their voices to speak and, and change the landscape in many ways. You know, that's, that's an interesting space mm -hmm. and I'm all for it, but I can't seem to detach myself from the notion that NIL is amazing, yeah. but it's still not compensation from where it should be coming no, from, right? Not at all. The universities right. make all this right. money. Right, right, right. right. I, I absolutely agree 110%. But I think as players continue to gain their voice by understanding now that they have resources, and as legislators look to try and um, regulate NIL, yeah. or the NCAA looks to try to regulate NIL, I think that's when we'll see more, not only student athlete empowerment, and then they're gonna use that lane through social media to continue to speak out about things they see in the real world. I think there's gonna be a trickle down effect in that regard. That's what's up, man, that's yeah. what's up. D.C. Statehood, mm -hmm. Ty Hops and Powell. Yeah. No LeVar? Oh, bruh. Yes. <laughs> Definitely, man. Shout out to my brother, uh, LeVar Stoney. I think he has a an incredible future. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I'm just going to say for me, no breaking news and no nothing. I just think for me, one day he would make a good governor. One day. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, not saying I'm, I ain't saying one this tomorrow. Day in the next. I think one day in the next couple of years, I think he would make a great governor. Lavar Stoney, mayor of Richmond. Mm -hmm. I, listen, I think you'd be an amazing governor. Yeah. In the next. 30 days. <laughs> <laughs> you know. You know. In addition to him. And, and again, shout out to our brother, uh, Stoney. There's another brother. Uh, out of Charlottesville, uh, went to UVA rather, named Dr. Cameron Webb. Yes. Cam served as, Cam. Yeah, yeah, Cam was special advisor um, to the president during COVID, um, served, you know, in a wide variety of different capacities, ran for the 5th Congressional District, uh, should have been, or he was the, the Democratic nominee, lost the race, but by far the most qualified person. Yep. Cam is Superman. Cam's legit. And, and, and I amazing think that, wife. Yeah, amazing, amazing wife, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Both, you know, amazing kids, comes from great stock, yeah. humble beginnings, made his way up. I think Cam could could honestly be a president. And I know that may sound crazy. And, and, and there's people, you know, shout out to Wes Moore, you know, and, and all these different people. But I think Cameron Webb has the gall and the chops from a political acumen, from relating to people, from being just a good solid dude to be a presidential candidate of the United States of America. And that's a name to look out for. I like Cam a lot and, and I've been extraordinarily impressed with Cam, watched his congressional race. Um, I like everything about Cam. Yeah. Um, Cam is amazing, but he's no more presidential than you. <laughs> nah, bro. I don't think that. I'm, no, I mean, like, yeah, 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 hey, yeah. Man. Yeah, I'm flattered, uh, but but I don't know honestly if I could get back into the political game in that regard. Okay. Like I enjoy spending time with my people. Yeah. And that's what I like doing. Do you think you? This is important. Do you think you're not in an elected space right now, right? Yeah. Do you think that? you would lose or sacrifice something for going back to the elected. Yeah, time. 
Who break that down? Yeah, Tom. When when I was elected, um, my my oldest daughter um, and and my bonus babies, uh, they they had to pay in my marriage. Yeah. Like there was a major sacrifice. Yeah. And it took a toll. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like on our families from from having from having to yeah. be there in elected space. I look at my baby girl Stokely, that's not a reality that she knows. Yeah. She doesn't know her dad as the elected official who has to go to the um, city council meeting, who has to go to the budget meeting, who has to show up at this or that. You gotta who study is, for all this yeah, if you're not to, sure right, up, yeah. to, to, to be sharp. Yeah. They don't know, she, she doesn't know that side of her dad. I serve as the chair of a housing authority board, but she comes with me to all of those meetings. Ever since I've been chair, she's been at every one of those meetings yeah. with me. She does not know the feeling of having to share her dad mm. with the public outside of things that she also enjoys doing, i.e. coming to, like, she knows her dad is the commissioner of the Tonsil League, and there's, there's, a, there's a thousand black folk at Tonsil Park, but a thousand of those black folk all know Stokely, and they're going to be looking out for Stokely. And if daddy has to leave, daddy has help in place where we can go. She doesn't know a life of sharing me. And, and honestly, I wouldn't want her to know that life. And then secondly, the sacrifice of having to play um, a political game with things that I am not the utmost interested in is not a time and space in which I want to share my time and space. Mm. I am solely focused on advocating and empowering our people. I love all people, but I want to do the things that I know are advantageous for our people in our communities and do those things solely. That's real, man. That's real. So much respect yeah. to all my political friends. I mean, I get asked, I, I literally get asked once a month to run for this or that or let's think about doing A, B, and C. And I'm flattered. Like, I'm, 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 like I don't want to come off as if, like, I feel like, yo, nah, bro. I, like, I, whenever someone thinks so highly enough of you that they think you can lead people in an elected space and you can run an election and win, that's that's something to, to, to appreciate. But I know um, my purpose in this season of my life. Mm. And I want to run that race. And that's what I'm doing. Well, look, man, you have done extraordinarily well. And like I said, I didn't know you really before this. No, 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 we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Right, right. I didn't know you that well before this, but I tend to watch, you know, without even really reaching out, man, I watch who are the fellas really doing it and representing for our people and who I feel are not doing it for the gram yeah, or yeah, for yeah. the <laughs> clout, but are really engaged in uh, moving our people's agenda forward, man. And I have watched you. I, I found out about you at Charlottesville, mm -hmm. but I have watched since then, man. And and I just I'm so proud of all the extraordinary things you've Appreciate done. Appreciate that, man. Uh, I can tell it's rooted in a fundamental and basic love for black people. Yeah, yeah. And really, man, that's the start of it all for me. But uh, you have you've never sold out. Mm -hmm. You have never uh, compromised your integrity, and you have committed yourself, man, to being a community man and a father throughout, man. Mm -hmm. So. Full respect. We're going to toast again with your water, man. All right, toast with the water, I'm man. I'm extraordinarily proud of you, yeah, man. Yeah. And uh, listen, I got your back always, and I think a whole lot of folks do around the country. And vice versa, OG. Hey, appreciate, appreciate you. Man. Cheers to you, man. Mm -hmm. mm. Holly West, King of Charlottesville, um, we're proud of you, man. Keep standing up for black folks. This is the caucus room. Come back, join us next week. This is Don Calloway. Peace, y'all. Thanks.